it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The truth is in the bottle and the blood. In vino et sanguis veritas. In wine and in blood there is truth. The intoxicated mind expresses truth more clearly and occasionally more loudly than does the sober. And blood will always tell. I didn't like to admit it, even to myself, but I had a drinking problem. Of late, I didn't drink because I wanted to, or because I enjoyed the fine wines and booze, which I did. I drank to fend off the shakes, the misery my life had become. But most of all, I drank out of weakness. I couldn't bring myself to do what I needed to do to handle my problems, so I hid in the mind-numbing bliss of the alcoholic. <gasps> I wasn't supposed to admit that. Well, who am I kidding? My name's Vincent. I come from a long, illustrious line of cliché Italian gangsters. My wife hated it when I said it that way, so naturally I did my best to annoy her. I was a child of one of Dad's secondary wives, but he'd ensured that I had it good. All the best for Papa Nick's kids, even we bastardos. Yep, live in the dream. Well, among my current problems was that my favourite purveyor of fine wines and distilled beverages had shut down because someone had decided to widen a freeway into his store, while not in the way of the direct path. It had to close because the exit had been closed and construction delayed until he was squeezed out of business. <sighs> Talk about Bastaros. Yeah, stupid highway department. Took away my favourite oasis. I drove around and looked blearily for a store that would have what I wanted. No, what I craved, what I needed. I maintained enough alcohol in my system that my once quick mind had turned to sludge, slow moving and dreary. It took a moment, but I recognized the area of town where I was currently putting the other drivers and myriad pedestrians at risk. <sighs> Doesn't matter, I'm on an important mission, I reassured myself, and then let out a boozy, wet laugh. <sighs> Pathetic. If my mind had still worked properly, I'd have been sickened with myself. Hey, what's that place? I'd never noticed it. Pliny's delight. Spirits and fine wines. Well, I might have been a booze hound, but I like my spirits fine, and at that moment, I could still afford them that way. The employee who greeted me was a lady of indeterminate age who sported long, henna-dyed locks that cascaded about her shoulders in a very attractive fashion. I was instantly smitten by her gracious manner and winsome smile. Welcome, traveller. How may we help you today? Well, good evening. I'm uh, looking for a particular Italian red. Actually, a Sicilian vintage. I explained what I wanted, and the lady nodded along in understanding. Sir, I apologize, but we're currently out of that brand. However, we have an older vintage that inspires the flavors you seek. It's a nice match, and is aged, well, more significantly than is typical. But it is uh, slightly more expensive. It took me a moment to cipher through what she'd said. At first I got a little mad. Shit, she's trying to gouge me, I thought. Yet her sincere smile and, well, the fact that she was exquisitely beautiful with a hint of the exotic, combined with my wife's recent coldness, which was one of my many problems, well, I decided to cut her a break. Okay, I'm up for something special. It's the weekend after all, well, after tomorrow. It's only Thursday, right? I gave a wheezy little laugh to cover the fact that I truly wasn't sure what day it was. She was game, and that smile, that lovely enticing smile, widened and became even more radiant. It is only Thursday after all. Oh, if you'll come this way. She indicated the counter area with her left hand. Her hand was open, inviting, tempting. I went. She took a key from a little pouch at her waist. She wore a lovely skirt that covered way too much, but revealed a nice peek at her shapely calves. Okay, best check that. She may not be interested. Don't need any scandals. Well, any more scandals. I was on thin ice with my business partners. My family with a capital F. 
There was a cabinet that stretched floor to ceiling behind the counter, and the glass doors included gold lettering that proclaimed Special Reserve. The bottom third was enclosed with rich wood, and the doors to it were carved with symbols of naked women, trees, and men with goat legs. Satyrs, yeah, maybe fawns, maybe Pan himself. They played some pipes, and the naked women held forth a cup to the figure in the center, a human-looking male, seated on a throne made of grapevines. I'd been staring at the carving for a moment. Bacchus, the lady said, as though she'd already said it once. Well, maybe she had. I'd been pretty zoned out there for a moment. The Roman version of Dionysus, according to some. To others, he's a separate Italic deity. He's the one seated in the middle. I nodded blankly and she let loose that radiant smile once more, then crouched and stuck the key into Bacchus's groin, just below where his toga hovered above his, well, you know, gods have all the buona fortuna. And she was in the way, so when the cabinet doors opened and she reached in for a moment, I didn't really see what she did. I was busy watching her crouch. Oh, she had such enticing curves. Then, the next thing I knew, she was once more standing and proffering a very old-looking bottle of wine to me. She held it out carefully, and in a way that invited me to take hold of it if I wanted to. Well, if I wanted to preview the bottle as it rested in her hands. I didn't really need to look at it. I wanted it. If she offered it, it had to be the best. I somehow knew this in my heart. I nodded and took out my platinum card and I was soon the proud owner of a bottle of very old wine that came with a nice velvet sack to keep the fragile container safe. I had another sack, one of paper that concealed a more recently distilled brandy. As I walked out, I noticed it was nearly dark. How long was I in that place? I wondered. Crap. I'd have to listen to Francesca gripe and chew my ass. Oh well, at least I could get juiced and tune out that whine she got in her voice when she was mad. I didn't wait on the brandy. I had a nice glass that fit perfectly inside my metal coffee cup. I could drink what I wanted, and any nosy citizen or stupid cop that looked would just see me sipping cafe. Sure enough, I barely hit the driveway and pulled in around back, and there she was, harping away before I even exited the car. Where have you been? We've been worried about you. We had dinner an hour ago. I was about to start calling hospitals and police stations. On and on. I almost told her that I didn't need her wine. I had a very special reserve bottle of my own. But I didn't. I refused to confront her any more than I'd confront my personal demons. And on she continued. Chiara needs some help with tuition again. Dante needs new books and a new computer. Oh, you promised you'd take care of them. They really are trying hard to do well in school. Oh, God, is she still going on? I winced internally as I shuffled toward the side door to our far too lavish home. A home that I owned, but which was now filled with luxuries we could barely afford. At least on what I made for a living these days. I clutched the soft velvet of the wine bottle sleeve in the crook of my arm and slouched my way into the house and straight to my little office. Francesca chattered away like an angry squirrel close on my heels the entire time until I closed the door on her and locked it. She stood quietly for a moment, then raised her voice and started accusing me of neglect and even abuse. How dare I ignore her? How dare I shut a door in her face? Then she started in with the crocodile tears. God, had that ever worked? Well, yeah, in our early days. She could push my guilt buttons because I loved her and wanted her to be happy, but all of that had been washed away in emotional frigidity and liquid fire. I heard her stump away as I dug out my nice corkscrew and opened the bottle of my new favorite drink. I took only a shot glass full of the wine. It had been very expensive, but well worth it. Still, I wanted to conserve the beverage and enjoy it over time. I was already fixed from the brandy, so the wine was purely a connoisseur's delight. Even mildly inebriated, I enjoyed the smooth and many-layered textures of the ancient vintner's art. By the time I decided to stumble to bed, I was surprised by my son in the hallway. He'd been clearly waiting close by to ambush me. 
Dad, I can't believe you closed the door on Mom like that. You know I've been waiting like all afternoon to speak to you. That's what his mouth appeared to be saying, speaking in his sniveling tone and peppering each sentence with the word like and ending with an upward whining inflection, as though every statement was a question because he was too spineless to make a statement unless he knew that the other party would just ignore him, as I normally did. What I actually heard, though, in my mind was, I don't know why I bother speaking with you. I wish you'd just send a deposit to my account and then go pass out. I effing hate you. It was a surreal experience, as though he was a foreign language movie with a dub voice. Well, I, like, ain't none too fond of, like, you either, boy. Why don't you, like, grow up and, like, get a job, you sniveling little loser? The words were out of me before I could stop myself. But, well, they felt pretty good and were certainly well-deserved and long overdue. The little idiot had no idea what I did for the family every day and of what I'd done in the past. His biggest responsibility in life so far was to pick out a video game for his moronic friends when they got together online. No one would put up with a little turd in person. Oh, I said more. I lit into him until he was sitting on the floor, head buried between his knees and covered with his folded arms, crying. And then I went upstairs. I was no longer groggy. In fact, my mind had become preternaturally sharp. Not in the way that an inebriated person believes himself to be, but with senses humming and my mind focused, my feet sure on the stair steps. Oh, great. The boy's outburst, or more likely my response, had awakened the harpy. Francesca met me outside of what had been our room for so many years, where I had all but moved into the guest room in recent months. There it was again. Her mouth was moving, saying things, predictable things, but what I heard was... You attacked our poor boy. He's so sad. All the prescriptions he needs, but no sympathy from you, you monster. I truly hate you. We all do. I want a divorce, but we're stuck until the kids get through college and move out on their own. Well, at least I can keep screwing Gary and get the satisfaction of cheating on you with a whim. What? You're screwing Gary? You cheat and the best you can do is our piece of shit accountant? He's a total pencil neck geek. You truly are a whining and worthless skank. You want a divorce? Why well, wait? I'll file tomorrow morning on my way to work. In the meantime, you and your poor boy can pack. Well, she stood there, gaping like a freshly caught fish. This time her mouth moved, but she didn't speak at all. She couldn't speak. <sighs> What's the matter, whore? Gary Katz got your tongue. I stalked past her and toward my room. It was mine, for real. I wasn't going to leave. I owned the place and she'd signed a prenup. If anybody left, it'd be her and those worthless brats she'd whelped and spoiled. The next morning I awakened, well rested and in a bright frame of mind. I realized that I'd clutched the bottle of very fine wine in my arms and I'd placed a shot glass on the nightstand. Normally I'd be trembling and craving a drink. Yet, this morning I didn't. Well, I wanted a drink, but I didn't need one. <sighs> Got ready for work. Friday at last. I felt a little hungry, but I really didn't want to have to speak with my family. and I certainly didn't want to listen to any of them, so I filled the tiny glass and sipped at the amazing vintage until it was bone dry. I eased out the back door and managed to escape the driveway before anyone noticed. Dante would be too embarrassed to even look at me for a while, and Francesca, well, that slut would be too scared. She'd admitted her infidelity, hadn't she? Well, she certainly hadn't denied it. I stopped for a light breakfast at a little neighborhood diner I liked. The lady behind the counter, Margaret, greeted me as she once did more regularly, but well, I hadn't been eating much lately. I'd been on a liquid diet. Hey, Vincent. Good morning. I haven't seen you in a while. Doing okay? That's what her mouth said. But what I heard was... Wow. Looks like you actually took a shower. Haven't seen you this clean and well-dressed in a while. And whew, Miracle, no booze breath. Good for you, Vincent. He was always a nice customer before. I paused in the process of taking my seats. 
And this was weird. Last night I could excuse the illusion as part of my intoxication. Yet here it was daylight. Me completely, well, as close as I'd been in a long while to being sober, but it was happening. I was hearing the words she wanted to say rather than what she actually said. It was such a disorienting juxtaposition. I didn't know what to say, so I just smiled and took a seat on one of the stools at the counter. I ended up leaving her a nice tip for her kind thoughts. After breakfast, I called in and let the secretary know I'd be late since I needed to drop by and visit my attorney. The response I heard was, Yeah, sure. I bet you need your rest, Lush. Don't worry, though. Everyone else will take up your slack. Now I'll have to listen to your bitch half-sister rant about how worthless drunk of a brother. Oh, thanks, asshole. I wondered while I was eating whether my perception would still be different than what people actually said to me when I used the phone. No way Anna would have spoken to me that way. No matter what an ass I was, she was invariably polite, her features consistently inscrutable. Something weird was happening. With my newfound clarity, I knew that it had something to do with the wine. And I'd have to go by Pliny's Delight again and speak with that hostess about just what was included in this elder vintage. Oh, great. Like I have time for your bullshit this morning. Why can't you greasy gangster wannabes understand that you need to make an appointment? That's what I heard instead of the falsely polite greeting that Joel intended to send. I smiled and just decided to use the gift for a while. Oh, hey, I'm... Um, Sorry I didn't make an appointment. I know you're getting early to do prep work and took advantage of that knowledge. It's just that I'm... Well, we're ready to divorce and I'll need your help on this one. She crossed the Rubicon. She was unfaithful. Clear violation of the prenup. He stared at me a little blankly, processing the information. He was a dick, but an excellent attorney. Never mind what he said... This is what I heard. Yeah, well, who could blame her? She has a great counterclaim, with you being a booze hound and all. She even have any proof of the infidelity? Well, she's a nice looking woman, might certainly do her. Well, might as well dive off into the Q&A. Apparently I could hear mental clutter as well as conscious thoughts for as long as the person spoke. Well, I spent the next half hour answering his questions and figuring out what I'd need to do to get the ball rolling before she could prepare. It was hard to separate at first, but the more we talked shop, the more his words coincided with the movement of his mouth. I didn't know for certain whether his mind and words had synced, or my perception had clouded. Oh, maybe the effects of the wine had worn off. We wrapped up and I left the office, afraid I'd already lost track of my newfound abilities. If not, this power would be great if we had to go to court. When I got back to my car, a parking well, enforcement officer was printing a citation on her little ticket-writing device. I couldn't have been more than a minute over the time. Oh, excuse me, ma'am. That's my car. I'm here and ready to go. She turned around with a nasty little bureaucratic smirk. Yeah, well, too late, dickhead. I've already printed, so you can take it up with the municipal judge. Go ahead, argue with me. Come on, sucker. After I embarrass and humiliate you, I'll get on the radio and call off his attorney over to sling your ass in jail. As best I could tell, she'd said pretty much the same thing, but more politely and without the immediate threat to call in an actual officer. I thanked her, explained how I truly appreciated her service and hard work, and that it only meant to save her some time. She looked astonished that her little snarky trap had been sprung but left empty. I took the stupid citation and got underway. Well, the true test would be my legitimate business partner, Linda, my half-sister by yet another secondary wife. She'd been mad-mouthing me for a while, granted with good cause of late, but it had started long before my drinking had gotten out of hand. Come to think of it, except for the special reserve wine, I hadn't consumed any alcohol since the brandy last night. Yet I was feeling fine. Still alert, still sharp, 
not even a slight tremor. I greeted Anna as I breezed by to head to my office. Good morning, Anna. Thank you for holding the fort. Anything pressing? I knew there wouldn't be, but I wanted to hear what she'd really say. She looked at me with a little surprise. Good morning, sir. Nothing waiting for you, but a fight with your little sister. She's gonna kick your ass. I waved and nodded and continued on my way, and sure enough, when I entered my office, there was Linda, crouched over the keyboard at my desk. She was already scowling and spared me a look of utter contempt as I closed the door behind me. Oh, I couldn't wait to hear what was really on her mind. It's about time you got here, you worthless sack. What's the matter? Tie one on last night? Like every other night? I'm tired of complaining to Daddy. You need to go. Your crap's sinking the ship. I took one of my guest chairs. They were in many ways more comfortable than my office chair anyway. I had to stop by to see my lawyer. Not your concern, but I'm divorcing Francesca, so I may have to work on that some over the next few months. I know you snivel to daddy regularly. You've been doing it since the start, placing the blame for every failure, yours and mine, at my doorstep. Well, that's just who you are. I held up my hand to forestall her verbal repost. Thing is, neither of us would have had anything if our father hadn't given us this little business. It's easy enough work, and we don't even own it. Just manage it for his corporation. When I'd held up my hand to actually finish saying what I wanted, the gesture had made her angry. How dare I speak up on my own behalf? Okay, what I heard. Of course I tell father. I'm in it to win it. You've always just gone through the motions. Don't be too sure that I won't own it all soon. Daddy's getting old and is ready to start dividing up his empire. Then you'll be out on your ass, you and your whole wife and those deadbeat brats of yours, if they are yours. Oh, if only you knew that she's screwing our outside accountant. <laughs> I caught on months ago. Well, I must admit that I was shocked that she knew about Francesca and Gary and hadn't said anything. I was even more shocked that Papa Nick was about to cut me loose. I didn't think it was that bad. Yet I played it safe and went through the motions of apologizing and catering to her the loser bit to which she had become accustomed. Oh, if only she knew. When lunchtime rolled around, I called Papa Nick and asked for a meeting. I would have had to speak to him about Francesca anyway. He was old school to a ridiculous degree. Some things he'd let slide, but he frowned on divorce. Yes, I was sure that this was one instance where he'd side with me. It was one thing for a crime boss and his associates to have secondary wives, but... In the double standards of his world, wives just couldn't have affairs. That was a deadly sin to him. He was, surprisingly, available. After I parked my car outside of his office building, I stopped and drank a lunch of... Veritz... Whatever that label on the bottle said. Well, the label was old and distorted. I couldn't take any chances. I really needed to know the truth of whatever my father was going to say. His secretary greeted me calmly and sent me straight in to see the big kahuna. He didn't rise nor offer to shake my hand. His favourite goon Frank loomed in the corner and nodded as I took my seat. Frank was unlikely to speak or participate. He was essentially a piece of lethal furniture, there just in case. Oh, the old Vino was working well. So, how do you want to waste my time today? Come to snivel about your slut wife. I may not be able to let it slide, but I can't really blame her. You dickless little turd. Outmanned by an accountant. Maybe we should do a DNA test to see if you're really my son. Who am I kidding? With that nose and those eyebrows? Gotta be mine. Besides, his mother would never have screwed around on me. I think I surprised him when I smiled. All I'd seen his mouth say was... I'm busy, so make this fast. I'm sure he expected me to assume a groveling pose. Yeah, well, I'm sure Linda's already told you. Francesca's having an affair with the outside accountant. I hope you'll hold off on any direct action until we reach an agreement. I'm still putting together proof. Oh, I will definitely get a DNA test on Dante. 
That dickless little Turk can't possibly be mine. Chiara, though, poor girl, with that nose and the need to constantly pluck her brows, gotta be mine. He blanched a bit. I thought he might have a stroke on the spot. Well, at least I wished. Look, I don't want any favors. I know I've let things slide for far too long. I crawled inside the bottle to get away from my problems. It's not where I belong, and I will fix it. I will get back on top of the office. I just wanted to be respectful and let you know what had happened and what I was doing. I waited. His intended outward response was conciliatory, a bad sign, especially when I heard his actual plans. I really loved your mother, and I had high hopes for you, son, but it's too little too late, and you've broken too many promises to get yourself straight. I have legitimate sons and daughters, and Linda's doing a great job. You're just a drain on our bottom line. We'll take care of Francesca and Gary, but the grandkids may as well get everything. You just flush it down the Tiber. Scratch that. The Whiskey River. Best be careful when you leave the building. Never know who might follow and what they might do. Well, it was my turn to blanch. Et tu pater. I knew he was not a patient man, but I'd never imagined that he'd become so angry, so disgusted with me. He'd been disappointed when I hadn't taken on the criminal side of his operations full time. He wanted his legitimate heirs to stay legitimate. But bastardos like me could get involved with any nasty activities that would take care of his needs and allow his real kids to keep their hands clean and consciences clear. Well, I'd always tried to please Papa, but that short time among the wolves, like Romulus and Remus, had led to my drinking. I'd apparently become so worthless in his eyes, such a disappointment that he could casually discard my meaningless life. He rose and opened his arms for an embrace. You're an embarrassment. I'm old and dying, but I have pride and I will not have a drunk as any part of my legacy. I embraced him, and we bust cheeks in the old style. I knew it was a send-off. He truly was the last of the old-time stereotypical mobsters. As I left, I saw Frank Jr. in the lobby. He was definitely a source of pride for his father. He looked just like him. Same last name, same bulky goon frame. He smiled at me without humour and flipped up his chin in silent greeting as I passed. I turned around as I walked through the elevator doors and flicked my fingers under my chin and toward him to gesture, Fongul. He looked mildly surprised as the doors closed on his intimidating frame. I looked around to ensure that no other goons were already on my tail. Then I realised that Papa Nick might not have meant it. It may just have been something that crossed his mind. No, no, he was a hard case. He meant it. He just didn't have anything prepared, nothing more than a threat, and that was still only in his mind, or so he believed. He would set up something soon. It was definitely on his mind to kill his bastardo Vinny. It's probably where Frank Jr. was headed, to the big meeting. Well, I needed to get out ahead of the problem. First, I needed to visit that liquor store. I parked in the side lot of Pliny's Delight and walked through the very modern-looking entrance. Hmm, I didn't remember it looking like that. Yesterday it possessed a classic, charming look. The lighting was now much brighter and the place looked sterile and cold, not like the warm little shop I'd visited fewer than 24 hours previous. Hmm, guess I had been pretty lit. An older man sat behind the counter. He wore a neutral expression, perhaps a little bored. Excuse me, I was in here yesterday and spoke with a nice lady. Is she here today? I just need to ask about a very fine product she sold me. Well, I didn't care about his response. I listened for what he really said. But all I got was what he intended to come out of his mouth. And I learned to tell the difference. Sir, we currently have no female employees. Perhaps you're in a different store or mistaken about whom you met. I must have assumed a stupid expression as I stood back, confused, and looked around the store again. The cabinet. It was there, just as I recalled it, only now it didn't reach the ceiling, and on top was a very old photo. It was black and white, well, yellowish with age and era of photography, but there was no doubt. It was...
was her. There, he said, and pointed at the ancient photo. That's her in the picture. Was that one of those old-timey photo setups? He briefly glanced over his shoulder and looked at me sourly. Sir, I think you're definitely mistaken. That's the owner's great-great-grandmother. Now, the owner's elderly, so I'm sure the lady in the photo, the very authentic photo, is long deceased. Now, would you like to make a purchase or look at any of our products? I stood there, nonplussed, and trying to think. Something was definitely off about this place, about this man, and about what had happened just yesterday. So, um, she sold me something from that old cabinet behind the counter. A great but very old vintage. But before I could go any further, he raised his hand and interrupted. Sir, there's nothing in that cabinet. It's an antique, purely for show. We don't even have a key for it anymore. Now, if you like older wines, we have a few in our top-shelf selection. I could tell that he was impatient and really wanted me to buy something or leave. I didn't need the vino for that message to get through. I thanked him, maybe apologized, some mumbled, inane response. Perhaps the vino had worn off or no longer affected me. I rushed to my car in a panic and just took a small swig. I felt a little rush of energy, but nothing else. I knew I had to fix things. It might lead to more nightmares and problems, but it was time to do or die. Literally. As I drove, my memories strayed back to my youth. I'd had pretensions of becoming a wise guy like my old man. I threw out his name and used his reputation rather than building one of my own. And that's where the problem started. Eventually, I got crosswise with a man who didn't fear Papa Nick much less one of his punk kids. Big Jim Elliot had his own criminal enterprise and his own staff. Papa Nick could have taken him. His organization was bigger and more established. But there was no need, and wars were costly. I'll tell that to a 19-year-old trying to prove himself worthy of his father's attention. I made the fatal error of disparaging Big Jim in public, calling him small-time and a wannabe. Dumbass that I was, these appellations applied more to me than to him. On some level, I must have craved a fight, and I got it. In addition to shooting off my mouth, I was shooting pool at Lacey's Pub with some of my up-and-coming idiot friends. I was about to sink the eight ball and win another round. A cigarette dangled from my mouth. I had to talk some smack as I prepared to shoot, like I was in some black-and-white gangster movie from the old days. Yeah, well, I say Big Jim's a lightweight. Nothing without his crew of flying monkeys. And that's when the lightweight and his flying monkeys made their presence known. A shadow loomed over the pool table. Now, did I mention that Big Jim was called Big for a reason? His goons backed down my nascent crew with nothing more than hard stares. So, you have something to say about me and my crew? Try saying it to my face, sonny boy. He was definitely not taking this with grace or a hint of forgiveness in his heart. I glanced around and saw that my allies had turned instantly into quivering punks. They needed their leader to take a stand. Yeah, well, if you know... That's as far as I got. I don't even remember the rest of the thrashing and stomping I got and didn't feel it until I regained consciousness in the hospital. He'd knocked me out cold and then given me the thumping I'd needed for my entire life to that point. Papa Nick stopped by the hospital to visit and to ensure that I didn't finish digging my grave. You will publicly apologize to Big Jim. He pronounced it like a sentence, and that's what it felt like. Through the labored breath caused by my cracked ribs and broken nose, I tried to object. But Papa... Everyone knows he's just a fad. He has no stay in power like us. We... He held up a hand. I'll stop you there, Vinny. There is no we. If you want to follow in my footsteps, you'll have to prove yourself. You have no right to ride on my name. You'll have to do things that will wash away any notion that you're soft, weak, or a fool. Take actions that'll instill fear in others so they completely forget what a punk you were today. Well, now, it seems that Vino worked on me even when I talked to myself. 
I saw my next destination ahead. A building where a certain accountant worked. A real pencil neck. My blood began to boil, but I had to remain calm, composed, so he had no idea that I knew. He'd assumed that I was drunk and had mistakenly stopped for a non-existent appointment. He worked out of an older building downtown. There was a camera on the main entrance, but not anywhere else. We weren't the only clients who used the back door and preferred anonymity. Gary was a whiz with tax codes. We had regular accountants for day-to-day operations, but he kept us away from federal, state, and local scrutiny. I timed it perfectly. His receptionist took off at three on Friday afternoons. It was 3.15 when I sorted into his waiting room. I paused to listen at his door. No conversations, so no witnesses. Just some pussy-ass pop satellite music he liked to listen to while he worked. I knocked on his door, way more loudly and forcefully than necessary. Hey, I was a drunken loser who couldn't keep hold of his wife, right? I opened the door and bopped him with the edge as he approached from the other side to open it himself. Oh, uh, sorry, Gary. That was really bad timing on my part, I said with a drunken slur. He backed away, his hand clutched to his left cheek, and the red spot that grew and promised to become a shiner. I stepped closer to him, pretending to have concern. Are you going to be okay, buddy? Wow, that was really a knot. It's okay, though makes you look tough, like a gladiator or something, one of those guys in that spot to it show. He stood there shaking in mortified anger. He wanted to lash out, but he knew that he couldn't. He spoke assuaging words of forgiveness, but this is what I heard. You drunk a moron. If you'd stay sober long enough to plow your idiot wife, then she'd stop bugging me. You're not only a limp dick, but you're clumsy. Why don't you go dive off a bridge or something? I smiled, satisfied that the vino still worked. And then I decked him. I draped his body over my shoulder and hefted him up the back stairs to the maintenance access door on the roof. I looked around for witnesses, but unless someone in the next closest building deliberately watched with a telescope, they wouldn't see anything unusual. I quickly carried him to the edge of the building that had an alley below. He'd started to regain consciousness, so I stood him on his feet at the ledge and slapped him the rest of the way awake. So, Pencil Neck, you think I'm dickless? At least we agree that Francesca isn't much fun in the sack. I had the satisfaction of watching his eyes grow enormously wide and fill with fear. He stammered out what he intended to be placating words. No, wait, please... You psycho, you can't do this. Everyone knows I cuckolded you. You're a drunken fool, but people will notice I'm gone. They'll miss me. Why can't you just jump off the building and leave me be? I gave him my best wicked grin. I'm not driving off any bridges or jumping from any buildings. I find that I have something to live for. He gave me an owlish, questioning look, tinged with a hint of hope. Well, I dashed it, just as the ensuing fall dashed his brains in the alley below. Unlikely anyone would find him until Monday trash pickup at the earliest. (laughs) Very appropriate. Maybe his fellow rats would take care of some of the potential evidence. No one would believe a suicide, but there would be no suspects by that time. Anyone with a stake would be taken care of one way or another. It was now time to go to the last place Papa Nick would suspect. It wasn't easy to get in, but I still had keys and codes to everything from the last time I'd had to earn my keep the hard way for dear old dad. I knew that, except for the cleaning staff and a goon on guard, no one would be at his home. His real wife would be at yoga. It was getting late. He'd be leaving the office soon and headed home to where he did his true work, where he talked without reservations about his criminal enterprises, his sanctum sanctorum. I made it into the residence. Servants' entrances are awesome and usually forgotten, especially in these days when few people had regular servants, just contractors. Of course, when one had to keep crucial secrets, he tended to hire people and ensure that they had a vested interest in keeping their mouths shut. It looked like the cooking and cleaning staff was gone for the day. I eased past the media room, where a hulking figure sprawled watching some sports show. 
my own GT security. Almost there, and <laughs> Excelsior. The office. I rifled the Circus Maximus sized desk and found what I wanted for supplies. I used the restroom and then took up my hunting stand in what would have been the closet if this had been used as a bedroom. <laughs> hunting stand. I laughed internally, like I'd ever hunted mere animals. I liked animals, and I didn't need to prove anything. Plus, who wanted to go to the woods? All the time I'd spent in them had been invariably unpleasant. I settled onto a box and leaned back against the wall. I dozed off with thoughts of my first trip to the woods, but the hunt had already been completed before we arrived. I wasn't in the woods. I was in a car. Frank Senior sat beside me. He was my handler and coach on this first Return of Glory mission. I was nervous, naturally. I participated in getting some people back on track with a little rough stuff, but this was next level. I was in college. I should have been home writing papers or something. Instead, I was in this beater car with a souped-up engine, sitting beside Frank Senior, his garlic breath, waiting on a certain business associate of Dad's to leave his favorite side piece's apartment. The memory was just like then, but I drifted out of my body and saw from above as the thirty-something man in an expensive but rumble suit walked out of the building. I heard Frank Senior say, That's him. I didn't feel the nudge, but my younger body did, and both of us left the vehicle and walked towards the man. Frank Senior kept an eye out in all directions, but my body was laser-focused on the intended target. As we drew near, the man, about to put the key into the lock of his car door, paused and looked up, startled. <laughs> so much for the afterglow of lovemaking, I thought to my dream self. Then my body raised a little revolver and put it to the man's eye. I heard a faint pop as the small caliber pistol fired, and the man collapsed, quite thoroughly and very convincingly dead. The dream flashed forward to Frank Senior pulling me by the arm to get me going, of his calming words as we dragged the body quickly over to the beater and then drove out to the disposal site. Ah, this is why I dreamed of woods. Ah, a big state park, handy for hiding bodies. Flash forward again to this very room, to Papa Nick praising me for paying the bills. No, I hadn't fixed the problem yet, but I was on my way. I still needed to rehabilitate my reputation and, well, I still owed him. I awakened to hear the door to the room close and voices speak. Papa Nick and... Yeah, the Franks. I don't really care about updates and excuses. I have decreed him dead and that needs to happen quickly. Frank Jr. responded. Yes, sir. I'll go find him myself and take care of it. He reversed course and bustled back out of the room. After the door closed, Frank Sr. chuckled. Ah, he's a good kid, Nick. Cut him some slack. Your boy was acting weird today. More so than usual. No idea where the guys lost him, but he maybe ain't as far gone as we were thinking. Nick flooded his hands. He's gone to me, bastardo. I always needy, that one. Always wanted notice and affection. I gave him everything anyone could want in life. Yeah, he kept failing. No good at business at all. Had to keep doing contracts to repay me. Oh, don't get me wrong, that was useful. He eliminated a fair number of problem people for us. Had real talent for that, but no stomach. He sat behind the colossal mahogany desk and steepled his fingers. Maybe I should have brought him on the crew instead of letting him flail away at the business world, for which he had and still has no ability. He certainly showed more talent for slaughter than he did for anything else. Frank Senior took the seat to the right of his boss and handed him one of the two drinks he'd prepared. Yeah, he had the talent, but he took it to heart and let the work turn him into a monster. Monsters are careless. What he became made him weak in all the wrong ways, made him vulnerable to the bottle. He did the only thing he could have, he assured my father. Nick nodded. Oh, yeah, all but let him take out Big Jim. Some other outfit did it. Vinny was right about it, too. Big Jim was a punk. He sucker punched my boy, and my boy's big mistake was picking a pussy crew. Started him down the wrong road, and he never gained any self-respect. He sighed with finality. 
Oh well, water under the bridge. Soon to be a body in the river. He grinned and raised his glass in salute to his closest friend and his soon-to-be-dead son. I sat and listened and wondered if I was hearing the unvarnished truth. I'd slept and hadn't had a dose of vino. Yet these two were old friends. No doubt they were speaking as honestly as either ever did. Well, for all I knew, they were talking about something else, and I merely heard the truth. In any case, my father, whose approval was all I craved in youth, and his best friend, whom I'd wanted desperately to see as an uncle, a mentor, a centurion to hold my skills, had just agreed that I was a write-off. I had to stifle a laugh. <laughs> write-off. Reminded me of Gary the Taxman as I faced him forward for his plunge and gave him just a little bit of wedgie before I released him to the air. That meant that I wasn't wearing the stern and righteously angry countenance I'd intended when I stepped out from the closet. I didn't burst out all fury and mayhem as I'd planned, but wearing a grin. Wouldn't have mattered. The room was soundproofed, and dear old Dad's large caliber pistol was equipped with a silencer. Yet the drama became all business when I walked into the office room. First, I shot Frank Sr. in the head. Once for fun, and once to be done. The way he himself had taught me, though the large caliber did make a mess of things. Papa Nick whipped open his top drawer and dug for the pistol that currently filled my own hand. I waved it in a side-to-side -side gesture that mimicked a shaking head. He reached down to retrieve the little derringer he kept on his ankle. I stepped around the side of the desk and stomped on that ankle. He barked out a high-pitched cry of agony, then slumped out of the chair and curled himself on the floor, all while clutching at his wound. Oh, come now, father. We must show some dignity, some style, some gravitas. The lessons you ground into me. We must keep up appearances, best practices and all. He stammered with the pain, with age, with an already diseased and damaged heart. Vinny, please, we can talk. Why are you doing this? I favoured him with my most sinister smile. Oh, you talked, and I heard. Not what you said, but what you really had in mind. Now you and Frank just confirmed what I suspected. You meant to have me killed? For what? You think I'm an embarrassment? I started drinking because of the nightmares. Because of what you drove me to do. The bodies I've taken out and stacked in unmarked graves under the pines for you. Then I started drinking some more. My grin turned savage. I guess my piece of shit half-sister hasn't caught on yet. You have plenty of cause to have me eliminated. I've been robbing the company blind for years. Just thought you should know before you die. Oh, I've been terribly stressed. I slipped into the bottle all unawares, but I'm completely sober and I'm enjoying this moment. At that point, I was startled by a knock at the door. It's me, Frank Jr., sir. Oh, that brown-nosing piece of weasel shit. I chuckled. This was getting better by the minute. I placed the barrel of the pistol to my lips to shush Nick, who looked hopefully at the portal. I saw the look and shook my head in mock pity. Not gonna help you. I yanked open the door and grabbed the thug by the front of his shirt and hit him with the barrel of the pistol, then pulled him inside and shut the door behind him. He stumbled forward, but stayed on his feet. He scrambled for his own pistol, but stopped when he saw his father's body with the extruded brains stretched in front of the desk. He knelt beside the still warm corpse and grabbed its hand. I like to think that, just before I fired the round into the back of his skull, that he felt immense grief, immense loss and failure. Stop, I ordered before I even turned back to Papa Nick. He tried to sneak over to the door while I was savouring my triumph. He started and hunched his shoulders. At first I thought it was in resignation, but... Oh, no. This night kept getting better. I made my escape into the darkness. The bodyguard was still watching television and now had a pair of companions, presumably Frank Jr.'s team. No point in taking out the trash. I'd use Papa's phone to call in an emergency and... Just left the line open. Would love to see their faces when the police arrived. 
Francesca the harpy fled before me when I arrived at my home. She didn't want to chatter anymore. I didn't give her a choice. Freshly fortified by the vino, I cornered her in our bedroom. My bedroom. And I heard. Vinny, I'm truly scared. The kids and I just want to be free. Oh, I'm so scared. Please don't kill me. I did love you once, but you got so cold and then the drinking started. And then the screw-ups at work. Please... Don't kill me, and please don't hurt the kids. Not them. Never them. No. After a while, I couldn't tell what she was saying from what I heard. It was the same babble to which I'd grown accustomed. Oh, I can't believe that I ever loved this... this thing. And now she disgusted me. Used up, frightened, feeling genuine terror at my approach, at what I'm sure appeared to her like a stone-faced enforcer. Well, in wine... There is truth, and in fear there is as well. I didn't hurt her. Just told her to leave, that I didn't need to kill her. She was already dead to me. I even let her pack a few things. She, of course, hadn't taken me seriously that night. Dante emerged from his room, headphones dangling, and that vapid look on his face from when he'd been immersed in his video game fantasy worlds for too long. You can, like, get your shit too, pal. I'm sure your mother will need a ride. Oh... Francesca, you'll need to take numbnuts here for a DNA test. I don't think he's mine. And within six months, I cleaned up my world. I didn't keep the money I'd embezzled from the company. I used it to trap my hosebag half-sister. I really hadn't meant to become an alky. At first, it was just a way to numb my conscience. Then it was a show, a farce that became reality. I patted the old bottle with the exquisite velvet cover. It was nearly empty now. I'd used it often and to great effect, and the corporation, under the guidance of my half-brother, one of the legitimate heirs, had bought out my shares at a considerable profit in my favour. For some reason, he was intimidated by me. Pliny's delight was open. The lights inside the classic storefront twinkled and beckoned, and all appeared as it had on that first visit, the one when I was so hammered out of my skull. There were several cars in the lots, and it looked and sounded like there was a party inside. When I made my way through the front door, there she was, that lovely lady, no mere photograph, but here and alive. Welcome back, Vincent. I see that you enjoyed the Veritas Est in Sanguinem vintage. I trust that you found the truth that you sought. i just finished off the vino, and I understood the true question. Yes, I know who I am and what I am. I come from a long line of hard men who did hard things. I tried to be something else for the sake of my wife, my family. In the end, it was my family with a capital F that stirred my blood. She smiled. No doubt she'd received many such confessions, heard the realizations. She gestured with those lovely hands and smiled that enticing smile, and drew me toward the cabinet to try a new vintage. Plures crapula, quam gladius. More die from drunkenness than the sword. So a pretty nice way to start off the new year there. Starting off in style, as I mean to go on. Well, as I mentioned in the previous video, uh, looking for some input from you guys. What kind of stories would you like me to do? Uh, what kind of themes would you want me to cover in 2021? Um, open to anything, really. Going to be going forward as I have been uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And probably the series are going to come up on Sunday evenings as well. And of course, the podcast is there. Um, if you're not listening to the podcast, please do. <laughs> like a few more of you guys to go over and listen to that. If you could, it'd be great. Just... Uh, well, it's available everywhere. Apple, Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere where you get your podcasts, really. So, uh, links in the description, as always. Well, that's enough for me for one evening. Uh, pretty good start to the new year compared to last year. Let's hope it continues this way. So, back on Sunday with something. Not quite sure what yet. Hope you'll join me. Say you will. Go on. There you go. Until then, very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye.
thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.